Hello, this is the 26th, as I understand, episode of the Chat Chamber podcast, and we are delighted to invite Eric Christian Salga, who is one of the boys, as we just uh, <laughs> talked about. You have been in RGSL for quite a long time, and you really identify yourself in this place, as well as now the Financial Intelligence Unit of Latvia and the strategic, uh, well, yeah, strategic analysis division there, and AML Innovation Hub, you've been a junior associate, you've been also, you've traveled, traveled a lot, so I think you have a lot to say, a lot to share with our students, with our professors and, and uh, fans, if, if <laughs> there are any, of course. But yeah, it's really, I'm happy to, to see you here. How are you doing? No, I'm I'm happy to be here. It's um, I'm. Uh, I feel like I evolve alongside RGSL. So every few years, when I have an opportunity to come back, it's with a new facet. This is the first time I'm participating in a podcast, so that's pretty cool. So how has RGSL changed? If you see that you are evolving alongside RGSL. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I was thinking about it on my way here, and um, I think RGSL is um, is a great reflection of the current market uh, because RGSL is, uh, in large part, a private education institution. So it has to adapt to what the market needs. Um, and I've seen that both as a student here and then teaching here how certain requirements have grown, how certain competencies have lessened in importance. Um, and it's been, it, it's been interesting. I think most importantly, the pace at which RGSL manages to innovate and really cut off loose ends that aren't effective potentially and start new initiatives like this podcast. Okay, and what are the courses that you're currently teaching here? I think right now I'm teaching research methods and then this year I gave a hand at uh, data governance. Nice. So that was the first time I think we've had that course. Is it um, about like this holistic approach to data? Does it also about information security, data protection? What specifically? Uh, I think you, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think it's about a holistic approach to data and just uh, starting to look at data as an industry in itself, in the sense that um, we can look at uh, something like economics as underlying everything. More and more, I would like to argue that we can all also argue that data underlies everything and everything we do on a daily basis is somehow tied to digital data. So I think we're at the very beginning of this journey, but um, something that we're seeing in a few countries, we don't have it here in Latvia yet, is something like a digital ministry. Maybe that's the direction we're heading into. And that's exciting. As I understand, Estonia already has uh, a ministry of digitalization. Yeah, they have something. They have something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but um, about data, uh, what I wanted to ask is how important in your opinion is data sharing and what are the most effective ways of sharing data when it comes to solving international crime? In, especially if we talk about your field, you know, in AML and how can we innovate really there? What do you think? I think, of course, information sharing is a crucial part. The problem is how can one, oh, well, how can one be sure that the data that is being shared does not, uh, well, get into the wrong hands, even if these are public institutions. So, so how can it be encrypted? How can it be ensured that these individuals that have these access rights really are mm -hmm. vetted? And, uh, but yeah, because of course, international crime nowadays 
it's not something, it, it, especially about money laundering, right? It's not something, you know, it's not petty crime. These are really individuals, enterprises with so much social and economic capital to, to be able to, to, well, develop these schemes. So, yeah, that, that's maybe an extension to my question. These are complicated questions. <laughs> For me as well. <laughs> I don't know. I think, I mean, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to live in a paradigm. You know, if we look back 20 years from now, we can kind of tell like, oh, we were in a very flourishing economy. We were in a uh, Washington census led uh, neoliberal global movement. Um, markets were becoming more interconnected every day. We had a lot of successful or at least prominent international institutions, a lot of multilateral frameworks um, to guide trade, to guide uh, just uh, diplomatic relations. Um, and I think we all feel that that's changing right now. We have a lot of uh, examples uh, of frictions starting to arise in the world. Some of them are much closer to us than others. But with, with all, all the friction, I think all the tensions that's, that, that's taking place, especially at, at the geopolitical arena, um, we have to look at all these questions about sharing data again. Not, not digital data, but just any information again. And you can't take things for granted anymore. And it's, if, it's exhausting work, but uh, on, I mean, if I'll keep talking about the, the data perspective, you know, first of all, who do you share cybersecurity information with? Other countries, other countries that you trust, how do you know you trust them? Um, who do you share uh, AML information with? You know, same questions. How do you know you trust them? All of a sudden, just because you've signed a few documents and memorandums of understanding <laughs> or, or some sort of treaties, like what, what does that really mean? Um, it's a it's a scary it's a scary moment. We saw this um, when the first big waves of COVID hit. We saw actually how frail. Uh, Europe is where countries would ban export of uh, medical equipment to other countries. I think especially here in the Baltics that would be uh, that was very scary for us because if this was this was just a medical crisis, what do we do about uh, you know humanitarian crises or, or wartime crises? Are we going to look similarly fragmented or um, you know, was that just a one-off example? Mm. So getting back to your question, um, right now is a time to uh, assess who you trust, who you share information with, whose opinion you care about, like whether you're an institution or you're a country, and uh, also strengthen these bridges with the with the countries or institutions that you do trust to have somebody to depend on ultimately. You were a trainee at the European Stability Mechanism. So really how stable has been Europe in the last decade in your opinion in other areas? Uh, so the European Stability Mechanism acts as Europe's backstop. Uh, it was it came as a result of the uh, crisis we had in 08. The whole idea is that, uh, it, according to our treaties, we're not really allowed uh, as European Union or, yeah, European Union member states to give each other special loans or, or cover each other's debt in, in a very traditional way. So we created this institution that collects money for us and then that uh, money can be used to help stabilize the economies of European countries. Now, the best example of a program run by the European Stability Mechanism was in Greece, where it, essentially in exchange for reforms in the country, um, in their uh, fiscal policy, 
um, the ESM gave them uh, loans. Uh, that event or, or that group, let's call it that saga, was already, I think, one of the first signals in the Eurozone that we are not all on the same page. Um, we s right now, as we're talking about whether the world is in a new recession or not, we're seeing the same discussions for Southern Europe versus Northern Europe. Uh, and these discussions of a, a multi-speed Europe or a two-speed Europe are starting to rise up again. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how, how we manage through. I think the next big question, especially on the Baltic plate, regards energy. Um, and we'll see what the European Union, which is us, you know, us as individual representatives of countries decide to do about uh, supporting each other in you know the very hard winter that's coming. Um, I see this as an opportunity for some of the Western countries like Germany or France to step up and help us foot some of our bills a little bit obviously because we you know we are uh, the buffer for NATO uh, to Russia at the moment. I shouldn't say that, but you get what I mean. Yes. An external um, border. Yeah, we're, we are at the border. And um, of course, I mean, there, there, I think there have been a lot of studies done that show just how disproportionately expensive heating is for us in comparison to other European countries. And funnily enough, now the Northern Europe will be the ones who will have the most impact in the winter because of the energy prices, not the Southern Europe. So yeah. there's an interesting, I think, change of dynamic, maybe. And we'll see, we'll see how that evolves. And, and like with all of this, in the past 10 years, these have been kind of separate questions. The Eurozone stability as an economy, like the Euro as a currency, how do we manage, um, uh, monetary policy, then looking at COVID, that's been another issue. How do we manage aid among different countries? Uh, Brexit was a big issue. How do we manage, um, uh, what was it called? Um, like the, the democratic institutions of, of the European Union and uh, political will. Uh, and, and now it's becoming a military security issue and it's all like it, everything is mixing up in one very complicated pot uh, we're seeing the BRICS countries also starting to consolidate their positions more so China and uh, Russia in particular are creating uh, all sorts of, of agreements and just supporting each other's political positions and that means we have to do similar things uh, and that's yeah it's, it's we have a lot of hard hard discussions coming up on how much for example the European Union um, as as the international body that it is uh, we can't say integrates but uh, how in tune it is for example with, with NATO because more and more the like, an economy uh, is indivisible of national security. It's all critical infrastructure together. So we have to find ways how how to be prepared to become more isolated from the world right now. Yeah, I totally agree because. I, while you were talking, I started to wonder about the hard winter that's going to come. And it's going to be a tough one for a lot of families, not to talk about uh, like retired people here in our country, knowing the amount of pensions we have. But at the same time, yesterday, our government had a secret meeting and they uh, agreed to uh, transfer 200 million to help Ukraine. At the same time, not isolating 
like and solving our own problems within our state. So the question is, how can we get involved to financially help another country, of which of course is in a harder situation, while the situation in our own country is not that good, and we are not prepared for what's going to come? Because I believe that a lot of like youth is going to leave the country and try to support the families or whatever like the relatives that are here and i think eventually if the problem is not getting solved they're going to lose like latvia is going to lose a lot of its citizens so what is your like what is your thought of um, how to manage to isolate ourselves while there are so many like things going on and so many worries politically economically for a country to exist at this point And can isolation even be possible, given this model, at least in some international relations specialists' minds, that it's from the east a salami tactic that you yeah, just exactly. slowly try to, you know, peel maybe the oh, and borders. just like a thought maybe because people blame so much Hungary about what it did regarding the energy and everything, and it is like still getting gas from from Russia but at the same time I think from isolation perspective like it's thinking of its own existence in a sense that how for us for us as a state to survive when the winter comes when like I just like this paradigm uh, and uh, coming because it's coming and I think that we're gonna see a lot of like shifts and and, and also, about the like the parliamentary elections, I think in October, if if these the same numbers were last year, uh, we would um, be under a lockdown already. But as the elections are coming, everybody is like sitting and waiting for people to vote so they get their seats secured, and then again we're gonna see a lot of weird decisions that people are gonna rethink and then they will doubt themselves whether they did the right um, decision regarding the elections. So domestically and also internationally I think there are a lot of lot of things happening that we are not aware of and even if we are we don't know what to do. I think you're right, I agree. It's, it's a very complicated period. Um, it's, it's strange, it's almost, I mean, this would be a time to take a leap of faith within Europe. Um, to, I don't know, ad advance something on the basis of what, what, uh, what was that author's name? He called the European Union a project of political messianism. The idea that you know the the institution of a European Union will save all of us together, just just because we're united. Um, but uh, I think you're right. People live on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if nobody has a break to think about the future, uh, then we can only think a few steps ahead. You know? And again, those are our problems right now. How are we going to pay for heating? Who's going to win in the elections? Um, that, that's, that's about it. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know who, who should we give the, um, I don't know, who should lead us? just generally i think the question was really relevant also when you were at hong kong studying there all the protests of 19 20, of oh, 19 yeah. and also the year 20 they were something that you could observe in real time how yeah, did this that was a that was a situation that was indeed. that was rough it is about leading who will lead us right how much independence do we have actually yeah well, that, that was a very simple uh, example, like a manifestation to me of the growth of China's power. Nobody, expe the, the fact that in the general, like the general media, the general um, 
consensus all around is that <laughs> there's nothing you can do about Hong Kong. Um, it's an unavoidable uh, transfer of power. Uh, and uh, I think with that, we also see the, the expansion of, or the development of new global poles. You know, if we've been what we consider like a single, uh, in a single hegemonic world with the US, these, the, the, the aggregation of these little events in the world, now Ukraine being invaded, uh, Hong Kong, uh, I would say, I hope I don't get kicked out of Hong Kong for saying this, right? That'll be, that, who knows? Uh, Hong Kong being um, brought under um, China's umbrella a bit more. Uh, the evacuation of, of US military operations around the world. Yeah, we're in a, yeah, we're in an interesting spot. The question is, what do we do? What do we do? What do the Baltic states do? What, do, what does Latvia do? At least focus maybe on something that is more tangible and closer to. Yeah. Because, well, yeah, it would be good if we, if we solved all the political differences that people have in, around the world. But, of course, capitals are limited, like funds are limited. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, I think you asked the question who's going to lead us. I think that from my perspective, when I look at people also, like I came from Berlin last mm -hmm. night, and people are still obliged to wear masks, legally obliged to like wear masks on public transport. And I noticed, I mean, Germans, in my opinion, has have always been kind of those people who ob obey the law because they like they have a very complex legal system and they have everything described if I if they don't do this the fine is this yeah, democratic and, traditions also yes. a lot longer than for example maybe in, yeah. in newly acquired yeah and the European people states, but yeah. like I, I, I sense from the people who were wearing the masks in the public transport that they are more like kind of systematic robots that they are under like some bigger hand that they listen to while the people who didn't wear the masks in the public transport they were just looking at them and like smirking and thinking okay we're better than them and we can you know we are ready to fight for example so they're not that united also in that no policy. no so i started to wonder like whether that's a plan for us people to be made as like a like all united in being robots and not thinking with our own heads or like picking out people and making us being so differentiated that we cannot be united and like starting like a civil war whatever or like mass kind of how was the name what was the name mass protest psychosis uh, yeah what? maybe i don't know so I'm scared, honestly. It feels like I'm in between a decision to stay in a safe place, like like where my roots are to, with my family, or asking myself, I can move away with my family because the, like the family and the place in your heart is with the people that you care about the most, which is your like relatives. And then the question is, where is going to be better? Where is the safest place in this world at this point to be hiding from it? Because I think that so many people want to escape the situation we are in, but like there is no escape place really. And even your mind is not the safest place but to escape. But isn't at all times there's some kind of a doomsday mentality? You know, that the things are going the worst and nothing can compare to what has been done previously. How do you see these, I don't know, trends around the world? Honestly, I'm, for, for personally, I'm very scared of yeah. the aspect that people are getting drained out mentally. That they, that so many people have mental problems right now increasing because of the situation that they burn out, they cannot differentiate home from work. 
um, that there there are limitations for communication, and when the, the communication is like in a sense given out for them during summer because the restrictions are released, they run like crazy and try to travel around as much as possible. And then again, the COVID numbers go up. It's like a system, like a circle that's like repeating itself, which leads to a question when it's going to end mm. and whether it's going to end like in the nearest years. Specifically COVID? I, I think it's not. That's the thing. I think yeah. that is the doomsday mentality, what I am also referring to in a sense that though there are always some kind of news cycles about you know specific topics right and we can always tune into them and get afraid and and be you know concerned because we are empathic beings just like this time it's it happened to be the root was the covid but then there are so many things emerging from that like during the 08 as you mentioned right still people also had it tough was it tougher than now mm. to some extent yes to some extent no so how can we compare these these crises both have economic implications both make people mad naturally but the reality is that we do survive we're, you know we're relatively resilient and you just kind of get through it i think my uh, totally anecdotal uh, observations are just that the things we do we end up doing a bit too late you know um, I mean this is how we deal collectively with something like global warming or climate change like we the, the world should be able to mobilize when the need arises and all of, of court like it was late maybe but the european union did mobilize a lot of structural funds like together we did support each other um so i think hopefully we're we're fine but then from the other perspective i have to agree there are just i mean we have there's a war going on in ukraine that's insane that's uh it's something you read it. You read in books. I mean, until now, right? Like for m myself, I think you're. If we consider ourselves like in a similar generation, right? Wars um, of this scale, especially this close to us, is something really we've only been able to read about. I mean, maybe you had like you know the old Yugoslavian territories uh, in the '90s, but uh, and, and it, wars in, in other uh, or incursions in, in other parts of the world, not Europe. Um, I think it, now that you see actual, like an actual war going on in Ukraine, it's surreal. It's not something we as humans know how to deal with mentally. Like, and the easiest thing is to just not think about it. And of course, you can read about it in the news, but it, you know you can't. I, I'm I'm thinking to ourselves uh, here in Latvia, right? Like, uh, I've had people call and ask, so like, what are you doing? Are you going to leave? Are you going to, and I, I'm not going to, I can't think, I can't, li I can't afford to live life thinking that I'm going to get invaded. That's not a life. That's not, you know, it's, it's the same, um, like psychological phenomena. People keep mentioning, not people, but studies have mentioned about how you can live in very deplorable, um, settings and be very poor, but you can still be happy, you know, cause you just adapt to your, to your environment. And this is the environment we've adapted to. My fear is that we forget it. We forget that there is this threat of us, us also, you know, being invaded. I mean, who would have thought after 2014 that that what's happening in Ukraine would happen? That's an, it's it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. It, it uh, I can it's I can uh, believe a lot of things. You know, like it's easy for me to like rationalize a lot of things, but rationalizing. S the fact that in my generation, when everyone is interconnected, everyone has the internet, we can more or less see what's going on in most places in the world. Somebody can convince thousands of, of people to go and kill, kill other people. That's insane. But the fact that it's still happening makes me also recognize that this is, this is a reality. This can happen here. And uh, 
then I, I have to think, you know, are we doing enough to prepare ourselves? And that's the unfortunate, or fortunate in this case, position that we are in the Baltic state, we in the Baltic states are in. Yes, we're, we're providing proportionately to ourselves um, and to our defense budgets the most uh, support to Ukraine. But that's our job, because if we don't do it, who else will do it? Um, for us, you know, like we, if we don't rally around this banner against uh, Putin, against what the Russian government is doing, no, like who else in the world will? So I think this takes our discussion a bit away from, from this mass uh, psychosis. Uh, but I, I, I think this is an opportunity for us um, as, as a region to take leadership and take ownership of like a movement uh, in the world. We return to, yeah, at the end of the day, like I, I can't live thinking about war every day. You can't live thinking about it. And our politicians aren't going to live thinking about it. Their constituency is worried about like how they're going to get uh, wood uh, and, and gas. But um, the fear is if we don't, if we're not loud enough, if, if we are not annoying enough to the rest of the world, then um, are we really going to be that surprised if we get invaded? You know, like Georgia what? happened also. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, exactly. It was just uh, after the start of the financial crisis. An interesting way how to maybe also divert the attention yeah, of what yeah. was happening then at Russia. So these things already have, well, let's say a case. They, they yeah, we have yeah, yeah. case studies for it. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to continue on that. It's rare that history repeats itself, but the saying I like is that history echoes from itself. Mm -hmm. And we've been, you know, this region has been invaded a lot historically. And yeah, like going back to, to your point, like, do you know, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know how much time we have, right? Uh, we have. Uh, these questions you pose, do you leave or do you stay? I think this kind of dichotomy has been so ingrained into our um, Collective like psychology. Collective, yeah, yeah. Psycho here in this region, because it has been so extreme for hundreds of years. Of okay, like will I will I stay here or will I leave? Totally uproot everything just to survive. I think it's what makes it difficult for us, unlike something like uh, the Scandinavian countries, to be truly uh, commu communitarian or focused on developing the community, and it makes us more individuals, individualistic. Mm -hmm. You know, our, I think, uh, also total anecdotal experience, right? But I, I think our strongest pillars in our community are family units. And like, when you think of how, you're, how the country's developing, you look at m me, my family, our collective wealth, what can we achieve, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Um, do you go outside of that circle much? Do you invest much in, in uh, you know, out, outside of this basis? I don't think we do that much. That's why our, we have so many political parties. They change a lot. They're very unstable. Uh, they have very little um, uh, membership. Uh, uh, the number of members is very small for them. And many of them don't take on as, as kind of like a, an ideological base. And that's, uh, it's been like a survival strategy for us. That's how we work. Um, and now I, I think the thinking that you feel, and I feel, I think many of us feel, is, is also, again, a remnant, remnant of, uh, of this kind of experience that we've had collectively through occupations from Sweden, Germany, uh, the Russian Empire, and the Soviet Union. Um, here again, we have to think to ourselves, is this time going to be different? Are we finally confident enough in ourselves and in who we are to take 
uh, take a stronger stance. Um, uh, I'm not a, a Latvian historian uh, by any means, but uh, what you know in the world sentiment, what what I've read is you let you know you let the Rush you let the Soviet army in. Finland fought. Mm -hmm. Similar issue now with Ukraine. This the 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 fact that uh, Ukraine is very visibly fighting. I think that's a very important signal to the world. And we're when talking about kind of leaps of faith and consolidating ourselves, this is also something we can. I mean, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I haven't. I don't know the details, but I think Lithuania and. Estonia now also have this uh, mandatory yes, draft as yeah. well as uh, Finland yeah and so of course Russia itself also has the same yeah. principle so we're the last ones in, sense in the region is it a logical step for us I think for sure why not uh, and it's important it's important for us to see that we are you know to see that people are leaving this circle of family unit to think about the country uh, whatever this idea of a country is, on a on a you know a, as a symbol in itself, and then maybe uh, you and your family or my my family will feel more confident in staying here. May I ask you, for example, people in the government, it's like predicted that they knew of uh, the invasion of Ukraine beforehand, as it tends to happen in political stands that the governmental officials know before uh, the society knows. Because society knows of the event only when it's already happening. So why didn't the governments of European Union prepare themselves beforehand for the invasion to come? Why didn't they make refugee camps in, in advance? Why did they start to do things only when they were all already happening? Why did the governmental officials slept on like the, the thought, okay, yeah, Ukraine is going to be invaded on, on that and that date in February? What, how could they... Where was their inner human being in it? Citation needed, maybe. But the question is really how, how organized is the organism that is the state, really? Like, how many individuals know it? What actions have been done? I mean, it's always, it's, it's you know, part of the history. Avail. It's always been like that, that, like, the government officials know. Because it's, there, there are conversations, there are, like, ch exchange of information, statements. They come later. Some intelligence, of course, is leaked sometimes, yes. Just that I just don't understand from the human being perspective. If you then give official statements, oh yeah, we're gonna help, why didn't you help since the beginning? Why 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 do you wait if you know for sure? Of course it can be philosophical, okay, what do you mean with for sure? Because nothing is defined, people can change their minds. But I think that for example Putin was preparing for that for years. Like he was planning it for sure, and there was a first strike in 2014, and he threatened, and he did that again eight years later. It was his aim for eight years, so he wouldn't have began to do that if he was not like sure of his decision. Of course, people think also that he was a bit crazy, and he didn't plan it out very good, and he's, he is, in a sense, extremist, but... Um, I don't know. I don't. Know. It's it's crazy. It is. It's crazy, but it's crazy in retrospect. Remember in two thousand fourteen? Oh, like a few a, a few dudes sh showed up in Ukraine, and the world didn't really think it was that big of a deal. We put some sanctions up. Um, but I'm also to blame. You know, like as as an individual, like we are all. Yeah. yeah. What was my re Have I been? I don't know, protesting? Have I been writing? Have I been trying to convince everybody since 2014 that this is just the beginning? That this is, you know, this is a, like, a, this is the end of the world's uh, relationship with Russia in the form it is? No, I haven't. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a huge simplification, but uh, 
like just think back on yourself. How did you react uh, in in that situation? Just by the default, people thought, okay, I put a Ukraine flag on this. What does it change? What will Putin care? Awareness, at least, you know. But, yeah, but who you make feel better? Do you help the people who are dying there, or you f make yourself feel better that you did that? I've been thinking about this for a while, and I think that. Um, I mean, like the joke is like, okay, you're gonna share like this post. And yeah. You've done your part. You know, you're a you you sofa protester. Um, but right now, that that's just it's just a form of communication, and I think anything is better than nothing. Again, we all have to live our lives. That's an unfortunate or fortunate reality. Um, s putting out a flag. Protesting in any way or form, showing like a symbol of um, protest against what's happening in the world, is important not just today, but it's important for the decisions we will make in the future. It's important, how, especially towards how we perceive this moment. Perceive this yeah. moment historically, uh, I, and I'm looking at it from like a disinformation perspective, where historical revi revisionism is on. I mean, it's always been there, but it's especially now on, on a rise. Uh, I still have people I've talked to who live here who are, you know, all like generally close uh, acquaintances of mine. And they tell me, like, I don't, you know, prove to me that uh, Russia occupied Latvia. You know, these are very fundamental questions. These are things you can't, you know, like, it's almost, it's a sense of identity. It's, it's a historical event. Like, we can read about it in books. We can show all sorts of things. Um, but at some point, you do have to come out with, with the evidence. And here, um, these flags, the sharing of Twitter posts or Facebook, whatever, that is part of our historical evidence. Um, anybody who walks down the street today will remember in five, ten years that this was how people felt. Uh, and I would much rather see flags hanging you know, outside of windows than nothing hanging outside windows. Of course, of course we can always do more. Um, you know, don't, don't, get, don't get us started. We can, we can all do more, yeah. About, about these uh, fundamental questions, about these uh, revisionist tendencies. Also, my question would be maybe more about information spaces, but still, we live in some separate information spaces. These informative yeah, channels for people differ. Uh, we can see that sometimes also in like uh, public opinions, like what are the attitudes towards certain political mm -hmm. developments, both domestically and internationally. Uh, I think this also relates to your research maybe a bit about this legal differentiation. Uh, well, post the post EU integration of 2004, how do you see these tendencies developing after 2004 and I'll, I'll well, already nowadays as well. In regards to information spaces? But more generally also, maybe how this can, how we can see these effects nowadays uh, regarding vis-a-vis -vis the latest developments in the, of war, or I don't know, health But mostly policy. tied to how communication travels and... Yes, yes. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and I don't know. I'm, there are a lot of studies about this. I'm not I'm, obviously. I'm, I'm nowhere near an expert in this area. But um, uh, you just have to. I, I think about it. You know, in the sense that, like, where where does a person spend most of his time during the day? Like, you'll watch. That's stereotypically right. You'll watch some TV shows. You'll listen to some radio. Maybe watch the news, and then get your, I don't know, like, get information from social media? Most probably. Yeah, something like that. That's like a very basic division. And that's like uh, four, you know, like four hours a day. Those are your sources of information every day. So out of like a, like a fifth of, of the information that you get into your head as a human comes, you can like probably split it into like five parts. Um, and uh, I, if, like if, if you break it apart that way, it's actually very, it's scary because it's so simple. 
uh, again, this is my anecdotal experience. Like my, I get a lot of my new, I don't, I'm not super active on social media uh, because to me there's too much information there. It's just, it's uh, overwhelming sometimes. Likewise. Yeah, so uh, I get it from like my, my, my peers. So what they, what's important to them is important to me. And that way we build like these little information bubbles. Um, I think that's very organic. That's just how we've worked as a society for, for a very long time. The difference now is of course that it's very easy for you to stay in your bubble and you can find confirmation of what you want to find on the internet. Um, that's, I think, and, and studies are, are not, they, they don't see eye to eye on this. Uh, whether social media and this confirmation bias has led to more polarization in the world? Uh, I think so, but again, like, the studies are still out on this. Um, I think we're starting now, and this we see in some of our European Union rules uh, towards big techs, like Facebook, Netflix, uh, like the, uh, the big kind of data gatekeepers, that we, are, we want to understand what the formula are that they use in actually developing the algorithms and giving you information. So we want to make sure you have control over that a little bit, or at least you're aware that this is how information comes to you. But it's still this big black hole. And there's no, there's no to me, there's no easy answer here because ultimately, I mean, if, if we consider something like Facebook a private service, it's giving you what you want and what you're paying, paying for, you know, like, the feed you get is 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 especially made for you to enjoy it. Uh, so how is the country is a country going to go and tell Facebook like you can't give that kind of information? We already have we've had examples of this, right? Um, certain types of political agitation, they they have to report or highlight as something else. Um, Cambridge, the, the Cambridge Analytical uh, scandal also showed a lot of, uh, like, had, had a lot of downstream effects. Um, but uh, even, you know, how to proactively approach this problem? I don't know. It, and it's, it's, this, this leads us back, I think, to the broader geopolitical problem right now, which is uh, our global fragmentation is also an issue of values where our democratic values that that put individualism humanism and this idea of free speech and free thought at the forefront is in the current market environment very easy to exploit by other countries that uh, that don't do it like that and the problem is is that um, none of like it's it's not like we have the moral high ground. It's just a different ideology. For example, in China, it's culture. It's culturally accepted there that you know you don't speak against the state or you don't speak against certain elements. That's fine, and they they live life that way, and they consolidate their information. They consolidate their inf consolidate their information space, uh, and I think it makes you know in certain situations makes them more stable. Of course, we can see even in China now they have enough protests of their own and their economy is not doing too well with the housing market. But um, we, we lack some of these protections. Um, I think we lack some of these shields from external or at least, um, what are they called? Malignant forces. Um, a debate for us in Latvia, and maybe um, maybe it's moved on. I don't know. Is is what is the information space we provide to our Russian-speaking community? What do we do? You know, we we've, we've blocked or we're trying to block access to propaganda channels for them. But what do we give them in that you know in the place of? And somebody has to create this program, like has to make this up and. Um, I don't know. I think it's a. I think it's a. It's a big, complicated discussion, and uh, it's for sure a developing topic. And for, I mean, I listen to some podcasts uh, in 
especially before and, and during World War II, in the U.S., this idea of free speech, it wasn't as protected as we see it now. You were also not allowed to uh, loudly uh, criticize a lot of the exi existing, um, I, I guess, government or policy directions. So, um, I think there's a there's a there's a channel for us to become more guarded and more more uh, I'd say defensive about the information we share. But uh, it's a huge change in direction from what we've been uh, accorded so far, and what we've been doing with this. Mm. Um, Maybe as one of the like last questions, but do you then see currently that there is a correlation between legal differentiation and some kind of an informative differentiation in Baltic states? Maybe, especially if we're talking about like this, how should we react? Should there be even some different action regarding the non-resident status uh, which is happening and how does this go into the play when talking about these information spaces or other legal differentiations. Oh, like our happen. cultural integration As issues? well as, yeah, as well as that. Oh man, that's, uh, again, I wish, I wish I were more qualified to speak about this because I have a lot of opinions, but I'm sure they're all, they'll fall on deaf ears to people who have studied this more. I think it's, uh, you have to, that's the, you know, as I get older, I feel like context becomes so much more important all the time and nothing is as simple as we want it to be. While, unfortunately, things can be very simple. You know, like a solution can be simple. You have too much immigration, build a wall. Simple solution to a simple problem. Unfortunately, there's a huge, huge context there, whatever that problem is. For us too, uh, we have much more qualified people here at RGSL to discuss this, but uh, um, we, I think in theory, could have had a choice after the breakdown of the Soviet Union to uh, ask O occupying elements to leave the country and we didn't do that and uh, this was a huge discussion on the international uh, flora about the Baltic states like will they kick a third of their well, a fourth of their population out or not it's humongous you know we decided not to do it and then we um, we put in some sort of safeguards for us which again retrospectively it makes complete sense um, now, uh, of course, this non-resident, uh, sorry, non-citizen yeah. status that yeah. we have, it seems like very backwards, uh, old, and uh, not fit for, fit for duty anymore. But, um, uh, we can take, no, 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 it's, it's fine. It's, um, I think we're headed in the right direction. I just think it's been slow. Uh, this is, it's a matter of generational change. Uh, again, talking to my Russian Latvian friends, many of whom I speak to in English because they've grown up in uh, here, but went to Russian schools. Mm. Um, they would tell me, I wish, you know, I, I wish there were no Russian schools. Cause like it, my life would be easier. I would speak Latvian, like I'd be like everyone else, whatever. Um, where of course we paid special attention to make sure that these Russian schools exist. Now, bit by bit, we're also standardizing our education. And this hopefully shouldn't be a problem in the future. But yeah, I do think we have like a bit of a lost generation where like also these friends, many of them like don't truly identify as Latvian. They have Latvian citizenship, you know, they have S's at the ends of their names, of their males, etc. But like I think, you know, what, what, what do we, what is the, the Latvian exactly that they have? Uh, and they have difficulty finding this in themselves. So they would call themselves European. They don't also call themselves Russian. They've been to Russia, Russia considers them, you know, <laughs> Balt, Balts. So they're neither here nor there. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Again, it's we're uh, we're returning to this the, the idea of us being individ individualistic. 
these aren't topics we talk about on a day-to-day -day basis, right? It's, it's not something where you see like movements on the street, like uh, let's integrate or let's uh, mm -hmm. excommunicate. Like, um, so I think these, it's like a slow transition. But here is the more, again, complex context, which is that after 91, we're still a very, very young country. Crazy. And many of these issues other countries have been dealing with for hundreds of years. So I think we've made, uh, well, our progress is very quick in terms of the cross-fertilization of cultures or integration. I mean, I think so. What do you think? I liked how you ta said that some solutions sometimes are very easy if we just want them to be mm -hmm. easy and they can work if we want them to work. But yeah, sometimes also some topics are weaponized in a sense for political election reasons. And, and in that, in that situation, it, come, it can become so weird. That I actually wanted your opinion on this. I was, uh, I was super, well, I still am, I don't know. It, it feels like the political, the campaigns haven't started yet, right? Like only some people are now submitting the lists they need yeah, yeah. to have regionally. When do they start? In a month, two months? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Soon. So I would think like the very easy Occam's razor conclusion here is that uh, our uh, very, you know, our uh, nationalist parties are going to have, you know, it's the perfect storm for them because there's a scapegoat, there's, uh, there's Russia, there's somebody to blame in Latvia potentially for our problems. We can easily point fingers. How do you think this is going to evolve? Do you think, uh, what do you call it? Not in Yeah, like National Alliance. Yeah. yeah. Do you think Do you think they're going to have much more support from their constituents than in previous years? I would predict that yes, because that would be the go-to choice of people that have seen emerge of various kinds of liberal approaches that have been implemented. Because I know that, for example, talking about LGBTQ, like we still have a large population of people that don't support that. I mean, older generations. Well, because they are a bit more conservatist of what is a family and what are like human beings supposed to be. While youngsters and youth have shown that they are very pro them and they want them to have equal rights and so on. But also taking into consideration the po like the version of how many Russian like people we have here, I would say that for them now there are two parties uh, that they can choose from and they are going to be their go-to. One is the Saskanya and the other one is like a new emerged like one which is getting pretty popular. But that's the thing, them. I think it's not that also simple from the Russian speaking uh, you know, side because from one perspective, some people can feel betrayed by the political rhetoric that has been, you know, seen there. I would be. Yeah, because in a sense, of course, most people in Latvia abhor to the, to the war that has that is happening in the East, and this also includes most Russian-speaking individuals. And and uh, at the same time, the newer generation, well, going back to your point about identity, they don't really completely feel uh, in tune with this Russian identity and they identify themselves as European. So there are this, there is this new generation that might actually, uh, well, of course, not vote for national alliance, but for maybe more centrist parties. And I think that's an other interesting maybe observation, what might happen yeah, during yeah, the election. But I, I wouldn't, if I was a Latvian Russian, I wouldn't, I wouldn't vote for a national alliance because why would I be blamed in my culture because of what Putin is doing? Like, it's not like their fault it is happening. And that's, that's a point, that's a discussion in itself. Mm -hmm. Can you blame, like, in this situation, can I blame Russian constituents for what their government is doing? And the, the, ob the, like, the simple answer is no, obviously. It's, it's a government's decision. But at the same time, if it's a whole system of power that's being prepped up by the people. State traditions. Um, 
are they not partly to blame for this? Should we pretend, you know, should we speak to our friends in Russia, like many of, you know, many of us have friends in Russia, as if, uh, you know, they're not uh, part of the part yeah. of the problem, uh, or are they part of this? I don't know. How should we go about this? Um, this goes back, I mean, we can look at this, look at it from a more systematic perspective, which is we have sanctions already. And this is just, it's like a personal sanction you have against somebody. I think my conclusion was that you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis per individual. But... Um, Honestly, I don't know to whom I'm going to work. <laughs> Who to blame with? Yeah. yeah. But anyways, I think this opened my perspective a bit on what's happening around the world. I think your analysis also on the importance of data was quite insightful, uh, as well as really, I hope that also the viewers maybe, you know, got uh, some additional value from this discussion and really thanks for, for being here. Maybe there's some comments that you would like to wish uh, the listeners of the podcast or just... Who are, who are the listeners of the podcast? <laughs> that's, that's a good question, actually. I would say... My parents, your parents. <laughs> probably, probably. <Yeah. laughs> the people we shared this with. The yeah. students who are interested in the topic... And also, uh, maybe they're interested. newcomers yeah, of the... who would like to know more yeah. about you as a lecturer, you know? Secret crushes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think this is a great initiative, and I really think uh, somebody should take over and keep it going. Actually, I, I think that's what... Well, talking about innovating in RGSL, right? I, RGSL has always been very supportive of new things that students want to take up. I remember many years ago when I was in the Student Association, I wrote like one or two articles of our school magazine. But also, you know, in a three-year program, there's a, you don't have, there's so little time actually to get anything going um, for, for the bachelor of students, I mean. Mm -hmm. But uh, you guys have, are, have already put in so much work that this should, this should become something. And uh, we think so too. Yeah. And I think the school, the university should uh, support it, you know, outside of just the two of you down the line. Yeah. Thank, thanks, thanks, RGSL, for, thank for supporting this until now. And thank you for being Thank you, RGSL. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a good ending.